Hey everybody, this is Sarah Spencer with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and this is an extra special episode of Know Your Dogs because we are live from Jacksonville. The Georgia-Florida game is tomorrow. Uh, we're going to give people a couple minutes to tune in, but this episode you can ask us questions. I've got my work phone right here, so if you have any questions about the game, if you want to chime in about where you think this game should be played, go ahead and do it. I'm going to go ahead and bring in our Georgia beat writer, Chip Towers. Um, Where's Chip? Hey. Chip. Hey, what's up? What are you doing? I, we thought, got I thought this was a tailgate. We're at the stadium. We're what? supposed to be tailgating. It is a tailgate, but they call it the world's largest outdoor cocktail party, but we still got to work a little bit here. Oh, you do a goodness. little bit of work, please. Okay. Come on now. Come on. All we'll right. talk about this. Okay. Chip, thank you so much for joining me. I'm glad to be here. I really <laughs> am glad to be here. Thanks to all of you for tuning in as well. Um, and like I said before, I've got my phone right here, so if you have any questions, go ahead and tune in. If you see me staring at my phone, it's not because Chip is boring me to tears. <laughs> it's because I'm actually going to be looking for questions and comments and answering them in real time. Chip, I think the first thing we should talk about, this has been a really like hot button issue, Yeah. is where should this game be played after the contract is up in 2023? Yeah. So obviously it's been in Jacksonville for a long time. There's a lot of history there, but at the same time, Kirby Smart has had some comments about how he would prefer it to be home and home. Yeah. Stetson Bennett, Chris Smith the other day said as much too. Yeah. So let me get your take on that and also just what you think is likeliest to happen. Yeah, the, the players certainly and, and a lot of fans are towing the line that's kind of been thrown out there by Coach Kirby Smart kind of gently at first when he came at Georgia, you know, after you win a national championship I think he realizes you can be a little bit more opinionated uh, he was asked about it and, and to to Kirby's credit you know he's diplomatic about it and uh, certainly talks about him understanding you talked about the contract understanding the the financial ramifications of it because look to be clear the city of Jacksonville you know makes a point that this is more lucrative for Georgia and Florida to play here in Jacksonville than it would be to be home and home that's you know part of the deal uh, recruiting. Obviously, recruiting is a big piece of it that Kirby has brought up a lot. Um, now we'll get maybe we'll get into my opinion or your opinion, uh, our readers' opinions uh, here eventually. But the a fact lot of, of the people, matter, a lot of people, it seems like they want they like the idea of Gainesville, Athens. Right. But I think some of that is you just you love going to college towns. Well, and, and there's also so we're here, right? We're yeah. down here, right over yeah. there. We is can't a, fake this background. It, it, it's not a green screen. We are literally in Jacksonville. There is an RV park full of people. <laughs> uh, I'm staying on Amelia Island. It's covered up with Georgia people. We have some other colleagues that are up in St. Simons this weekend. I was in St. Augustine yesterday. It's covered up with Georgia people. So you know, uh, whatever your, the referendum is on it, there's still a hundred thousand plus people mm -hmm. that are going to be here for this game this weekend. Uh, I checked earlier today. It's a sellout. It's expected to be a sellout. It's always a sellout. Eighty-four thousand seats. Uh, it looks like about fifty-seven to sixty percent of these, those seats they're predicting are going to be Georgia fans. So, you know, certainly Georgia, number one, undefeated. They're going to be a little bit more excited about this year's game than the Florida fans. <laughs> they're, they're, they're four and three right. and one and three in the league. Uh, and that is always the case. But, you know, uh, the, the contract does expire in 23. There's an option to extend in 25. I really don't know what that means. But we, obviously we saw a statement, a joint statement, uh, put out by the two it programs. Say much of anything. It, 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 what it, you could read between the lines, though. Well, that's what I was going to say. The fact that there was a joint statement really was the statement in and of yeah. itself. It's like we're fielding questions about this, so here's a statement. We're going to wait until the contract actually expires. Now, I don't believe that actually because you you, you can't wait till the end of the 23 season to address it. It's going to be addressed well before then. And, uh, I, you know, I have always believed, Sarah, I've covered this game. 1985 was the first time I ever came here. It was, it was actually the Gator Bowl then and not TIAA Bank Field as it is now. Uh, but, I, you know, I would have said it's never leaving here because sure. of the tradition. That's how it felt for so long. I mean, I, we both went to Georgia. There's, there is such tradition there, like Frat Beach is something that oh, people love. Yeah. Students in particular love doing COVID kind of messed that up a little bit. There's no and longer, the landing is no longer the, here, yeah. which was a huge hot spot. Now, I, I understand they're working on a new landing. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be called. Uh, there is a development in place, but 
you know, uh, it's not what it used to be in terms of uh, a gathering spot for a mass amount of people. So let's talk football after I get your opinion. Should it stay in Jacksonville? Should it be home and home? Should we get creative and do something, I don't know, like do something completely different? Well, as I mentioned before, I'm staying on Amelia Island, which is about 30 miles north of here. Uh, I've stayed in St. Simons. I've stayed in Jacksonville Beach. I've stayed in downtown Jacksonville. I've stayed all. I, you've you know, been on the beat a long time, so I, like inevitably I, you've cut, you're, you've been all. I've over. tried it all, and, and you know, so I'm kind of old school. I like it down here. I like the tradition of it. And here, we're going to get into the matchup of the game here in a second. We will talk X's and O's eventually. This is this but is this, a, this was important. I don't think enough people talk about this. I think Georgia has a better chance of dominating this rivalry. They lead it now by about ten or eleven games depending on which side you're counting, uh, by playing it here. It's a neutral site, and the team with the is best personnel. Yes, it is, totally. Okay. There's 50 There's 50% of the tickets go to Georgia, 50%. doesn't matter where it is. Mm -hmm. Inside that stadium Inside, right there, yeah. it's half and half. Sure. And so there's no inherent advantage on the field. And so when you play neutral site, the team with the best personnel generally is going to win. Right now in the Kirby Smart era, that's Georgia. It's clearly Georgia, not Florida. Now, during the Spurrier era, he had the better personnel. They won most of the time. I think it, when you go home and home, there's more extenuating factors that give inherent advantages for the home team. So I think Georgia loses some of that, and Florida as well, every other year by having to play on the other team's home, home, home field. So, you know, we'll see how that turns out, but I think it helps Georgia overall that they play it here in a neutral site okay so the line is 22 and a half about just checked a minute ago it's so still 22 and a half it is a little crazy we talked about this the other day georgia florida the rankings don't matter that much where you are in the ap poll does not matter all that much because it's a rivalry game teams get up for this game no matter really even how good or bad you are i mean obviously that does come into effect but this is a game where crazy things can happen. We spoke and with do, yeah. we spoke with Mark Rick the other day about that 2007 game yeah. when Georgia upset Florida and had the Gator stomp where they stormed the end zone after scoring that first touchdown. So if you haven't watched that, go back and watch it. So anyway, it's a game where anything can happen, but the line is 22 and a half. And to me, that makes me raise my eyebrows coming into this rivalry game. But I think it's an indication of Florida being pretty down this year. It's their first year under Billy Napier, however. So, you know, you have to give him time to do his thing. But yeah. what do you think of that line? Will Georgia win this game by 22 and a half? Would you take the over or the under? Or what, yeah. what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, I've been uncomfortable with the lines that Georgia's been getting all year. But if I'm not mistaken, so they've Georgia's, they, the yeah, Georgia's 7 and 0, and I think they've covered the line five times. Yeah. And uh, they've been huge favorites in all those games. This is a record favor. Uh, for a record underdog for Florida in this series, as I understand it, 22 and a half points is a lot. And, you know, you were talking about the game itself. It, it really is fascinating to me, and I don't know what it is about this game, but it is as momentous of a game as I've ever seen. In other words, if the momentum gets swaying one way or another, it's very hard to bring it back. And I guess maybe that's just because it's 50-50 and it, one team starts doing good and – the other side gets a little bit quiet, and, and I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, but so like any other game, you know, special teams, turnovers, mistakes. This game big can plays. get ugly. This game can get it's it's gotten very sloppy quick, before. Yeah, very quick. Yeah. Think about last year. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, you know, that was a really close game until in the end of the second quarter, Georgia forces some turnovers. Nolan Smith, which Nolan I'm going to ask you about him in just a second. You know, those guys. Uh, uh Nicobe Dean ends up getting an interception, a pick six, and just suddenly... To indicate, just to indicate how authentic it is, a couple minutes ago, the Florida bus drove by. Exactly, we're, we're just getting, parked right over there now. Yeah, yeah. four-wheelers are driving by. I'm kind of glad the Florida bus didn't stay directly behind us. Yeah. That would have been was, an interesting it, it, background. It would have looked like a, 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 a gator remote. We would have looked remote. like we had some bias a little bit there. But Nolan Smith changed the direction, uh, changed the momentum of that game last year. Yeah, he yanked the ball out of the hands of uh, Anthony Richardson and... And, uh, you know, look, he's going to be number 15 for Florida. Their quarterback will be a big factor. And last year it was a, his first start in the series, and Georgia really ate him alive in that second quarter, Nolan Smith in particular, and really turned the entire game. And, and Georgia was able to 
pushed through in the second half of, you know, what was it, 34-7, to 7, I think, last year. So, uh, But the score wasn't the best indicator, and that's another thing that I'm saying. This game can get sloppy if you're not careful. Yeah, I think right. because it's just such a physical, intense game. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, you talk about the intensity. You know, it was funny when we were talking about Mark Rick the other day, uh, and I got a chance to talk to Rennie Curran, who was a freshman that year in 2007, and he said the thing he thinks about on the Georgia flight, he just can't. He couldn't believe how intense it was. Like he said, from the time they come over the Matthews Bridge, mm -hmm. and you can see all those tailgaters, yeah. you know, down at the bottom. It's no joke. To the game get, kicks off, you know, it's just there's an intensity about it. Mm -hmm. That and listen, that's going to be here today. The Gators right now, they may be four and three. Uh, they know what the line is, and they are living right now to knock their rivals off and knock them out effectively. A loss here today with Tennessee next week could knock Georgia out of the SEC Eastern Division race. And so that's what they're thinking about. So that's a good point, and that brings me into the next thing I wanted to ask you about, which is what kind of challenge is Georgia's defense in for both today and I know you don't want to look past this game. I know Kirby Smart and all of Georgia, you don't want to look past this game, but these next few teams, whether it's Florida, whether it's especially Tennessee, who leads the nation in you know points per game, uh, these next few teams, Mississippi State, Kentucky, they are going to throw on this Georgia defense, and, and this is the really challenging portion of this Georgia schedule. And I know a lot of people will say, I don't actually think that that starts today. I think it starts with Tennessee. I think it starts today because, again, crazy things can happen in this game. So what do we need to see from Georgia's defense today to make sure they don't have any kind of letdown? There's not an upset that could – pretty much ruin your season. Yeah, well, you know, it's going to be pass defense is what you're going to look for Georgia to be strong in against the Gators. And, you know, it's the craziest thing. We talked about Anthony Richardson a little sec a second ago, and he's one of those guys. He's a very enigmatic quarterback. He can be really on or he can be really off. And uh, we saw that when they played Tennessee. Um, the, the Gators lost a one-score game at Tennessee, but in that game, Anthony Richardson throws for 423 yards. He looked like a Heisman. He, looked like a, he was about to win the Heisman. I mean, he was, that was he much was earlier spoken this season. Of that yeah. uh, uh, earlier this year as a Heisman Trophy candidate. He had a great game against them, and you're going to see something similar. Obviously, nobody throws the ball or really operates on offense quite the way the Tennessee Vols do right now under Hendon Hooker and Coach Josh Heupel. So I think it's going to be very important for Georgia to come in here. They're going to try to make – Florida one-dimensional. Now, here's the irony in that. Florida's very good running the football. That's what they do best. But they're not great on offense, and it, it, a Kirby Smart defense can absolutely annihilate any, any offense that's one-dimensional. So they'll seek to make Florida one-dimensional, and that's probably going to be to force them into throwing the ball and then defending the pass. And, you know, Georgia's been great at it so far this year. I think they're fourth in the league or so in pass defense uh you know they're nationally ranked in in every defensive category uh they'll they'll seek to prove that today or tomorrow now florida florida's defense not good on third down georgia's offense very good on third down a lot of that is stetson bennett who has a birthday yes happy birthday stetson <laughs> should we pause watching, here and everybody sing stetson, happy birthday if stetson bennett is watching our facebook live you know to get, prepare for the game and to listen to our insight Happy birthday, Stetson. Yeah. But he would, of course, like nothing more than to beat Florida on his birthday. But I did want to ask what you've seen from Stetson so far this season. Obviously, it's all relative because with Georgia being number one, we're holding them to a very high standard. Yeah. Stetson Bennett's having a good season. Yeah, really good. Yeah, but there have been some moments where he's looked a little bit off, but then, you know, he'll bounce back. He's always pretty efficient. That's kind of his thing. Uh, even when maybe he's not having a – great game Georgia really just can go to the run yeah um, what have you seen from Stetson so far this season and what do you want to see from him against Florida well he's been very good this year overall obviously uh, you know he's completing more than 70 percent of his passes uh, you know he's not a prolific passer I mean he can be but he hasn't been here of late but you look at the early in the year uh, what they did against South Carolina and Oregon you know that that was uh, as good as you could possibly be uh, as efficient as you possibly could be on offense. Now, Stetson hadn't played very good against the Florida Gators. Uh, I think he's completed 43% of his passes in two games. He has two touchdowns, three interceptions. But you have to sort of include a big old giant asterisk in there when you talk about that because 
in 2020 when he was the quarterback of record and Georgia lost. He throws a touchdown pass to put Georgia up 14 to nothing in the first inning. He is absolutely, in his words, I was smoked on that play. He got annihilated. His shoulder. He and talked he, about his shoulder and how that stuck with him for a while. For the rest, of, I mean, he didn't play for the next. Uh, he tried to come. He, he stayed in the game for a little bit while longer. Georgia lost Marcus Rosemey Jack Sank on the very same play, a 32-yard touchdown pass. Georgia goes up 14 to nothing. Stetson's shoulder popped out of socket. He goes to the sideline. They have to pop it back in. Oh, gosh. Uh, suffice it to say. Oh, that makes me cringe just thinking about that. And he wasn't the same, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, so he didn't play great in that game. Now, last year he played well, but it wasn't really up to him. Georgia was running the football down their throats. He got it done, 161 yards passing and a, and a couple of touchdowns. But he needs to play really well here tomorrow. And he needs to play well from here on. He said the shoulder, he, he injured that shoulder again. In, uh, in the Missouri game, mm -hmm. on a, he got uh, squished on a run play. And, Which, uh, looking back, that makes a little bit of sense because Georgia's offense struggled so bad against Missouri. If you remember, they had yep. they kicked four field goals before they found the end zone. Really, until the fourth quarter, Georgia it looked like they might lose that game if Missouri could if Missouri's offense could capitalize more. And you look back on that game, and it's like ah, that I kind of believe it that that shoulder was really bugging him again. Yeah, it was, and, and uh, I mean Georgia almost exclusively ran the ball against Auburn to to great effect, almost 300 yards and they got it done. But in the last game out, you know, I think that was part of it. Georgia really threw the ball a lot against Vanderbilt. Also, they were ranked last in the country against the pass. Georgia threw the ball very, very well. You know, Florida's kind of middle of the road in that respect. They have some great cornerbacks and defensive backs. They are getting pressure on the passer. Brenton Cox, of course, is here, former Georgia Bulldog. And Kirby Smart bragged on him. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's a difference maker is what he called him, a game changer. And, and Brenton Cox can be. So uh, protecting Stetson is going to be a, a great priority in this game. So Michael Baxter, a commenter, said, first of all, good up afternoon to everyone at the AJC. Good afternoon to you, Michael Baxter. He also said, yes, the Bulldogs will dominate the Florida Gators. And I wanted to read that one because I do think a lot of people, you can see they're putting up, they're putting up fly, uh, not fly, flags behind us. I think a lot of Georgia fans are coming into this game feeling pretty confident. Again, it's a rivalry game and anything can happen, but Georgia coming into this game does have a lot of reason to be confident. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's no reason you wouldn't be when you look at the, these two teams side by side, how they match up in terms of their strength and weaknesses, and of course, what's happened in their games this year. Now, Florida's played a, a tougher overall schedule. I think anybody would agree. They had a good win uh, early in the season in Gainesville against a number seven ranked Utah team uh, and at that point you know everybody's talking about Anthony Richardson as a Heisman favorite as a, a potential first round draft pick and then kind of reality hit so they're four and three uh, they're not very good on offense they do run the ball well they lead the nation in yards per carry a lot of that again has to do with Anthony Richardson but they have some backs that get the job done and as well Georgia doesn't have Jalen Carter most likely um, he's been out for a I'm while I'm eager to see that yeah I, I'm eager to see you know Kirby Kirby's, sometimes he sometimes he's sneaky though. He, yeah, sometimes he plays some like, games. You know, yeah. I think he'll probably travel here, yeah. and so keep your eyes out tomorrow for uh, number eighty-eight about whether he plays. Now, I don't. I don't think certainly based on the, you know anecdotal evidence that we have, Jalen's practiced just a little toward the end of the week. I think you may see him get in the game to see how he can do tomorrow. But I think it's the Tennessee game that you're really going to hope to have a hundred percent healthy Jalen Carter ready to go. What does Georgia's offense need to do to capitalize on some of those weak spots in that Florida defense? Well, you, they, they got to run the football. I'm eager uh, to see Kenny McIntosh yeah. in, in this game. I think he, he adds such a dynamic. He adds another layer to this Georgia offense being able to catch out of the backfield. Yeah, we, we haven't talked about this all that much, but I get the feeling that Georgia is, you know, has been holding some stuff back a little bit. They've been kind of vanilla really ever since that Oregon game. It's almost like they don't want it to be on film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, you know, that's the way Kirby is. But, uh, yeah. You know, he's very much, a, a, you know, a, a film hound, you know, and he yeah. doesn't want to put anything out there to, to show anything. So I think Georgia might have held back a little bit. Now, do they, you know, whip out everything they have for, right, for Florida, right. a team they're a 22-point favorite over? Uh, you know, I don't know. We'll see. Here's the thing. Every year this game is played after an off week. So – Every year, Florida and Georgia, they have wrinkles. They've had some time. They, they come in here with some wrinkles. There's going to be something uh, unusual that they do. Uh, and what that is, I don't know. But, but still, Georgia's standard is always going to be Georgia's standard. I, I think you're going to see them try to get the ball to Brock Bowers. 
You mentioned Kenny McIntosh. I think you're going to see a game plan much more similar to Oregon and South Carolina and uh, uh, significantly dissimilar than what you saw against Vanderbilt and Auburn. Give me your X factor for this game. I'll give you mine first. As we've talked Good. about this game, you, you think about it while I talk to these people. Yeah. Um, as we've seen over the years, this game can be a wild card. It doesn't always go according to plan for either team. Mine is special teams and turnovers, so I guess I have two. I think this is these are my two X factors. This is not a game where you can afford to be sloppy. I know Georgia's a 22 and a half point favorite. I know you're number one, but avoiding turnovers, taking care of the football, they're probably going to run a good bit this game if I if I had to guess. Taking care of the football, I think, is going to be my X factor for this game. I agree with that's uh, hard to disagree with, and especially as we were talking to. The momentum factor, especially in this game, is exaggerated. So when you throw turnovers into the mix, that really throws Mo onto whoever sideline got the takeaway. So that's a big deal. Uh, but I would say, for me, the top thing is running the football. Sure. I, I can't cite the stat right here because I didn't do proper research before we came on live. Chip, first, first you're sitting down to start the video. Well, I thought it was a tailgate. Then you missed. Uh, come on now. But, but. For a long time, how about that for an inexact stat? For a long time, the team for that has while. rushed for, <laughs> for a good long while, the team who has rushed for the most yardage in this game is one. I mean, it's a you go, go back and look. Look it up right now as you're on that side and you have and comment, access. Comment. Yeah, and comment about it. The team who has rushed for the most yards has won this game. Yeah. Now, you know, that's football one on one one on one in a lot of ways. That ain't but a mystery. That's Georgia not, that's is not. most effective when they can run the football. And list Listen, we haven't really, I mean, we saw that a little bit in the Auburn game. Uh, we saw a little bit of quarterback run with Stetson Bennett, 64 yard touchdown in that game. Uh, but really the old ground and pound, I think you'll see Georgia try to do that as much as they possibly can. The flip side of that is that is what Florida does as well. Yeah. So, you know, really, I think it's gonna come down to in the trenches, who can run the football. So Georgia's run game, I don't think it's fair to say they, they haven't had a good running year. That's not the case. Last time I checked, they were six in the SEC in yards per game. Yeah. Um, but then you also have to look at they, they have success throwing. So you're, you're going to do what works for you. How much of those numbers not being as eye-popping as maybe we expect, how much of that is honestly maybe just having three backs where you're really splitting the carries? I mean, you've got Dejan Edwards, who's a little bit more of a physical guy. You've got Kenny McIntosh who can catch out of the backfield and add that kind of dynamic. And then you've got Kendall Milton who kind of does his own thing as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's more about uh, kind of choice, right? Uh, I'm liking the music. We should have brought our own music. <laughs> when you, uh, uh, if, if you look at it, I think the, mo the more accurate way to look at it, you know, Georgia's passing for significantly more yards than they're, they're, than they're running for this year. But if you take a closer look at it, they're running and Some passing. Some of it is a run play, it, sort it, of. It's almost 50% sure. uh, if you look at rush attempts versus pass attempts. Sure. So they're much more balanced. Now, sure. there's also the Brock Bowers, Darnell Washington factor. Yeah. You've got to get the ball to those guys. And, right. and what Georgia's doing operationally now, they're much more of a true run-pass option team. Right. And that's because of those tight ends. I think you're going to see a lot of tight ends in you this game. You wrote about this the other day, that the tight end renaissance for Georgia, I guess uh, kind of for college football, but really Georgia, if I think of a team that knows how to use its tight ends, it is Georgia. Well, yeah, Darnell Washington, Brock Bowers, Arik Gilbert, mm -hmm. and Oscar Delp. I mean, those all four of those guys are a matchup problem for any defense. Yep. You, you have that. The other factor is the run-pass option. So Stetson Bennett calls a play, and it literally could be a run or a pass depending on what the defense is doing. And think about having Brock Bowers and Darnell Washington out there who can be blockers, or they can block for just a second and then pop outside. I mean, that's the most effective play Georgia has. I think you'll see a lot of targets of the tight end on Saturday. Okay, so Harriet Hoke on Facebook, and y'all make sure if you have any questions, I'm monitoring it, so y'all send us questions. Harriet Hoke said, it's funny that in Florida, it's called the Florida-Georgia game. That is funny, Harriet. I got, somebody got onto me on Twitter the other day and said, why are you calling it Florida-Georgia? I'm not, we call it Georgia-Florida. But down here, they say Florida, Georgia. I just want to acknowledge both sides, but obviously Georgia, Florida. Well, it's the it's the alphabet, number one. That's I think that's what they call it in you know Jacksonville and everywhere else. Right. But I think Florida, Georgia is a country music, a, a bro country. Georgia, Flo yeah, Florida, Georgia line. Florida, Georgia that's line. The... So I mean, I, I, you know, I think there's your differentiation right there. 
But uh, yeah, it's definitely Georgia, Florida in, in, the, in the state of Georgia. I, I was corrected on that a long time ago and told to write it that way. Us being, you know, the paper of record in the state of Georgia. Right. We call it the Georgia, Florida game. What do you, what do you expect to see? Last question for you, Chip. Do you think this could be Oh, a, then I can tailgate. Then you can a, tailgate, right. yes. You can get back to tail. You can have your cocktail party yes. as, the, as the name, as the moniker goes. Could this be another big game for Nolan Smith? Oh, absolutely. Are you, so Nolan Smith, uh, uh, we talked to him the previous week. Uh, we didn't get to talk to him during this week, but he's a Savannah native. And so anybody who's from, you know, we call it south of the Nat line. Uh, you know, he's from south of the Nat line. Stetson Bennett's from Blackshear. Kirby Smart's from Bainbridge. Anybody who uh, is from that area of the country loves, loves, loves this game. Nolan Smith loves this game. And Nolan Smith loves every game. Yeah. I mean, that guy, is, uh, he is an incredible vocal physical mature, leader mature. for this team the yeah. fact I, in fact if we talk about georgia's defense which i gotta admit they've done a much better job to this point than i expected they would be able to do especially when you take into account that they haven't had Jalen carter all year yeah i think it's incredible what they've done but nolan smith's a big reason i mean he was he He's was right a guy there in the middle those affecting. 15 guys that got in, in the nfl draft he would have made it 16 had he entered the draft. Oh, he was a prospect sure. that sure. probably would have gone fourth round or better. For sure. Uh, so the fact that he came back was a big deal. The fact that he's going to be on this field on Saturday is a big deal too. Okay, it is starting to sprinkle. So we are going to have to let you guys go so we don't ruin all of our equipment here. Chip, you can get back to tailgating. Yeah, thank you very much, your, yes. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much for taking the time, sir. Thanks to all of you for watching. Thank you for tuning in. and. We are gonna do videos like this pretty much all season long. We'll do more lives if you guys like this and also make sure you go to our YouTube channel and subscribe there. Thank you guys.